HTML, CSS, and SVG, the web stack. Um, so first about Git, we will be using Git um, as our tool to like store, work on the homework, work on the project, communicate with each other in the project, and so on. Um, and we also like to use it to um, collect your homework. So we have a script that, given the um, uh, repositories that you announced when you did your homework zero, or are about to do your homework zero, we will collect your homework. We will be able to look exactly um, at what you did, who contributed, um, and um, at exactly what time was your last commit. So this is how we'll deal with play phase. As every year, there is a little bit of an issue with GitHub giving you private repositories. Um, they're a little slow about that. Uh, I'm aware of that. I've had this issue before. Um, so what we're going to do is, um, probably on Monday, I'm going to wait till Monday, but on Monday I'll send out a form to everybody. Again, keep watching Piazza because all this communication is going to happen over Piazza. Um, and if you don't have a private repository yet, it will just ask you to put your GitHub name in there. Um, and then I'll send a list of these names to GitHub and they will do some expedited processing. So this might still not work. <laughs> and if this still doesn't work, uh, we will use a different mode of, uh, of submission for homework one, uh, probably a canvas Dropbox. Worst case scenario, you email it. But this is really worst case scenario. Just keep, keep watching Piazza. Uh, we will find the solution. The most important thing about the GitHub is really that it works for your projects. Um, and the, the, the great thing about GitHub, I will talk about this uh, eventually, is that you can also host the thing that you're doing for your projects directly on GitHub so that everybody can see it. Um, and so um, we'll get it working. Don't worry if you don't have your private repository yet, but you should have really requested your private repositories by now. So if you have not, Please do so now. Okay, um, this lecture, as I mentioned, is about Git and the basics of the web stack. So, um, version control with Git and HTML, CSS, and SVG. Um, generally, we have a no device policy, but today you should bring out your computers and you should actually type along as I go. Um, so, there will be two things. I can do the version control with Git, and you can go to the schedule and you can click on those links. Like, these are the two sections of this class. And so, I've never done this before like that. I will simply work with the website here. Um, it's a little bit of an experiment, but I've made an effort that it's, uh, that it's good for all of us. Um, I don't quite know whether I'll finish everything that I've planned for today. If I haven't, everything here is written like a tutorial. So, you should still be able to read it, because everything that is in the second part will be required for doing your homework one. Um, and homework one will come out today. Um, so. You should really, like, if you can afford to come on Tuesday and I'll finish up on Tuesday, that's fine. But if you want to get started with the homework, then I won't be able to finish um, and we'll read this. Uh, and it, it should be pretty self-explanatory. And you should also have read chapters 1 to 3 in this book already. Uh, and that should actually also cover the basics of four that you need to know for the homework. Okay. So, let's go to version control. And let me know if you can't read anything, if the text is too small or too so, um, I assume that everybody has Git installed. I'm not going to go through the installation process. If you don't, there is the official documentation up here. Um, and I will be using the command line interface um, to Git today. But more generally, why do we use version control? So who has used version control before? Okay, who has not? Okay, a couple of people. So, uh, good. So, the one thing that we want to do is copies of multiple states of files. Like, if you just work on your file system, you have probably some history that you can go back, but once you close your editor, this history is lost. Um, but sometimes if you do develop software, it's important to keep track of the history. Like, you would like to go back and see what, have changed, what has changed and so on. Um, you also want to be able to create alternate states. Sometimes um, you, you want to try out something. You have like a vague idea of something that could be a nice feature or something how um, this could work that way, but you're not quite sure whether you'll actually arrive at this point where it's successful, and then you will notice at some point maybe, wow, that was really bad, and now I, I suddenly need to go back. So you kind of need to have ways um, of handling alternate states. So you want to have branches in your repository. So you want to be able to say, I have a stable branch of the software that I, I develop, and I want to have like offgoing branches where I do some experiments. Then, of course, you want to collaborate in teams. And 
Writing a paper with Word and emailing it is probably a horrible experience, the most horrible experience of writing a paper, but it's even worse for software. Like, could you imagine sending like your source code files to your team members so that you jointly edit? You always have to communicate exactly which portion of the code uh, can you touch and so on. So version control takes care of that. It, it's, it's not a completely seamless process, but it's, it's probably as good as it can be at this point. Um, and then, of course, there's things like keeping your work safe. Um, this is a very important, especially students seem to do a lot of homeworks uh, close to the deadline. So uh, GitHub actually, or any form of version control, if you use it with a remote server, you can keep your work safe. You don't have to worry about hard, hard drive crashes. You can move to a lab computer, to a friend's computer, and so on, and simply keep working there with your code that is always stored. And then finally, also important is sharing. Like if you, uh, GitHub is really big because um, it's a sharing community. Everybody publishes their code there, it's open source. So when you develop something cool that somebody else can use and you're willing to make it open source, um, it's really nice to integrate with version control to make it able to, uh, to, to allow people to share it and also to get contribution from others. So there's two types of version control. Uh, there's the centralized and there's the distributed version control. Um, who of you has worked with SVN or CVS? Okay, who's worked with Git? Okay, that's a good number. Uh, so the centralized uh, repository approach is is the CVS or um, uh, um, CVS or SVN approach. Like you have clients and you have one central server that actually manages all of the versions. So everybody needs to write to one server. And all operations like history, commit branches, and so on require server connections. So when you need to look up uh, how the project started back in 2008, you really have to download this stuff from the server. Um, then um, the, the, the advantage of that is this is a quite a simple model. So like it's not hard to understand. You have to start. Everybody uh, can read and write from this central repository. The problem is that it's pr pretty complex for a larger project. So there's many different things, but especially um, write access is an issue. Um, for Especially for larger open source projects like the Linux kernel, for example. There's not one centralized repository where all the developers are allowed to write. There's a process of people reviewing the code before it actually goes into the repository. And that is really hard to achieve as a centralized version control. So that's why distributed version control is important. The, the key defining characteristic of distributed version control is that everybody has everything on his or her computer. Like the complete history uh, is uh, the complete repository and everything you can do to your repository is local. So you don't have a defined server. Like I'm showing here two nodes in green, but servers are by convention only in distributed version controls. There's no technical difference between the server that GitHub hosts and the Git that runs on your computer. So, uh, in practice, um, well, um, so the, the pros of this is that we don't have an access issue. As soon as you have read access to a repository, you can download it, you can work at it locally, you can keep your own, uh, create your own franchise, create your own commits, and then you can go back uh, to ask if the maintainer of the package where you um, actually downloaded it for the first time is interested in integrating your code to his repository. So uh, that is a very like, nice model for, especially for collaborative work on the internet. And of course, the, everything is local has the benefit that it's fast, that you don't have to have an internet connection. Of course, this isn't really a big issue nowadays. Um, and also, it has this commit often model. Um, so this is something that is a little bit different from SVN. Um, in, in SVN, for example, you have had one commit like after a day's work and you made sure that everything runs and that you all, all the tests run through and you were blamed if it didn't. Um, in Git, uh, GitHub, you commit every little feature. Like when, once you did something atomic, you changed something, you commit it. You write, okay, I moved the push button from left to right. And then you commit. But that doesn't mean that you need to roll out your changes to somebody else. And that there's this difference between committing and pushing it out. So the, the cons is that um, it's a little bit less familiar, um, I guess, especially to people who have used to, to uh, who have used uh, centralized version control, and there's extra effort to distinguish between committing 
and pushing and pulling. So there's the synchronization overhead. Um, but it's, it, this is not really a big issue. You just have to understand it once, and then you're good. And maybe another con would be that you, as you have the whole um, history locally, you probably need a little bit more storage for the space compared to um, a, a centralized version of the job. So here's a couple of different implementations. Um, there's um, CVS, SVN, I already mentioned that, and the Microsoft people probably know Team Foundation Server um, for centralized repositories, and there's distributed like Git or Mercurial, um, and we will be using Git in this lecture. So the first part of this um, Git tutorial will be about Git in general, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what, what, what makes GitHub interesting. So Git is, was created by Linus Torvalds, you probably all know him, he's the guy that wrote the Linux kernel um, back a while ago in the 90s. And it's the British-English slang roughly equivalent to an unpleasant person. So he also called it Git the stupid content tracker, and he actually said, I'm an egotistical bastard and I name all my projects after myself. First Linux, now Git. Um, and if you go back to the... Uh, to the top of the schedule, there's a couple of links about Git, and one of those links is a talk uh, that the Linus Torvalds guy gave at, the, at Google about Git. Um, it's not going to help you manage your homework too much in this course, but it's just fun to watch and really to understand a little bit about Git. So if you're, if you're interested in the history of it and in the motivation, um, then you could watch that. So why do you use Git? It's uh, pretty popular nowadays. Um, about 50% of the open source projects use this, and when I wrote this, like a year ago, that was true, I, my, my guess is that it's more today. Um, it's truly distributed, it's very fast, um, everything is local, it's free, and it's pretty safe against corruption. So, uh, I'm not going to go into details, but Git is, 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 is really safe against um, intrusions, corruptions, and so on, because it always hashes every commit. If, you're, if this is important to you, you can study up uh, on it, of course. Um, and then there's GitHub, um, and GitHub is just a great way of, of, of working with Git. So, here it says whiteboard sketch, I'll use the blackboard instead. <laughs> I can't find the talk. Right. Oh, some is clean here. So, um, the basic idea is like you start off with a repository, and you can think of a Git repository as a graph. So, the first time you create a Git repository, you start at node zero, and then you start working on it, and then you create a new commit. So, now we have two versions, and this is the latest version here. This is what is called the head of the repository. Um, and this is essentially a pointer back to this is the parent of this, um, this commit. And then I continue working on that. Now I've done four commits, and now we have the current head here. So let's suppose I am happy with what I did so far, and I want to publish this. Um, but at the same time, I want to keep working on, on improving the code. So I say, OK, this is now what I publish, and I'm branching off on a development branch um, to actually work on a new feature. So I would um, essentially just execute a branch command and then start working on that. So I would add a commit here. And then somebody comes and tells me, oh wow, I'm using your software, but it's really great, but there's one little bug that annoys me. And then you say, oh, okay, I'll fix that, but you don't do that here, because then you would have to go back and, and, and reintegrate um, the feature, but you actually go back to the master branch, and then you fix the bug. So here I fix the bug. Uh, okay, and then what happens here is that you could say, okay, I will just keep working on here, but probably this bug is affecting you too. So what you could do is you could catch up with that repository. So you could essentially say, let's catch up to this repository here. Uh, and now I would have, like, this would be a combined state of this feature, this new feature here, and then this bug fix here. So this is essentially the new development branch, the head of the development branch, and this is the head of your stable branch. Uh, so this is kind of how you work when you want to like release a piece of software, or if you want to like use a branch, so now what could happen is somebody else comes along and copies your code at this point here. 
So he would essentially, he, in GitHub terms, this is called a fork, but it's essentially this is just a, like a, essentially it's a branch of the repository. So he would start working here. Maybe he also creates a branch that he later later reintegrates. So this is a different person here. And then he could send you, and you, you, you stop developing, and then he could send you, okay, um, look at what I did, you can review that, and then you can say, okay, I'm going to reintegrate this into the repository, um, and now your code is here. So this is kind of the model uh, about, like, Git, like any kind of working drill with Git is essentially a graph. And you have <coughs> different parts of the graph, different branches, and all of the things that I said about this is the feature branch or the master branch and so on, these are probably conventional. So all of these branches are essentially equal. Um, but typically it's good to, to have one master branch that contains a stable piece of software, one development branch, and so on. So any questions about the conceptual model of, of um, distributed version control? Oh, so if not, we'll go a little bit into the details. So um, this here is a tutorial, and if you go through this, you will have used probably 70 or 80 percent of the comments, probably even more, that you will need for the homework um, and for projects. Um, so what I will do is I will actually do this, um, as you can see here, and you can go along. So I'll just open up a console here, um, and I'll type in this comments. So this first little piece here is just um, configurations, and you should do that. You should put your name here, and you should put your uh, Utah University email address here. Because this, yes? Uh, so if we use uh, Git uh, model products and we use different email address, uh, can we bundle those? Uh, you can do, like here I use the config global option, but you can also do a local config for the local Git repository. Um, so like if you like have this Git, uh, if, this have con if you have configured this globally, um, you just uh, do the local configuration for the repositories of all your homeworks and projects. But um, it will be important is that your name is correct. Okay. We're not going to check for the emails, but um, I've had issues before with somebody else suddenly like showing up in the commit logs of somebody's individual homework, um, and um, I don't know, like this should really not happen. So you should have a happy name. If the email doesn't match, it's not that important. Okay. So um, the first thing we do is we create a folder. So I'm create, um, I hope all of you guys are familiar with basic console commands, but um, um, yeah. So I'm creating a directory with the make directory command. Okay, so, and it's the first typo. So I'm changing into this directory. Edit it here. So now we initialize a get repository. So if you look at this repository at this point, or at this folder, <laughs> there's nothing in there. So we can see there is nothing in this repository, only the dot and dot dot, which are just pointers. So if I run git in it, uh, it initializes a git repository in this directory. And now you have a fully working git repository. That's it. Um, and now we can look at this, what happens here. So we can uh, first have a look at this top level directory. And this blue is a little bit hard to read. But this here shows us we have a new directory called dot .git. And dot and directories are hidden directories on Unix based. Um, Operating system. So let's take a look what is in this .git directory. Okay, we can see that there is a couple of uh, folders, and um, so there is the head, there is config, there is description. These are files, and then we have a couple of folders like hook, info, object, and references. The most interesting part is the config file. So cat prints uh, the content of a text file, um, and if I do that, we can see okay, we have like one. Uh, branch here, like these branches are denoted like that. And then we have some, some metadata, which isn't too important at this point. <coughs> so this can be a little bit more interesting down here. I've done this for um, a repository that has a couple of um, remote branches. So then you would see, like here you have a core, you have the remote origin, and then you have a branch master. So this is what it would look like if you have this configured with GitHub, for example. So, now let's create a file, and Echo is writing the text between the quotes here. Into this file. Okay, so 
If we look at the demo, we can see there's hello world in this text file. Pretty simple so far. So now <coughs> it doesn't really know anything about it so far. So if we ask git status, uh, then it tells us, okay, um, no changes, but there's one untracked file present, demo.txt. Uh, so to add this to git, we, can, we have to run git add demo.txt. And now if we check for the status, it tells us, uh, okay, there's a new file, demo.txt. So if you ever add a new file to your Git repository, you have to actually tell uh, Git that there is a new file. So this is essentially the output that I just showed you here. And now let's commit the file. <coughs> so the git command um, commit minus m, and minus m just tells me like this is the commit message. Um, and I'm picking first commit. So uh, try to be expressive with your commit messages because once you go back, you could uh, you um, you um, might want to know what you actually did in this. Um, in this um, little commit. So things like minor change and so on aren't too helpful. So um, I have committed, and now we have uh, we have this um, file in version control. So it looks like this, and let's check for the status. And we can see we are on branch master. There is nothing to commit the working directory. Please, there are no changes in the working directory. Git knows about everything that is going on. So next we change the file again and commit it again. So we are asking the world if it's uh, still spinning. And by using this double greater signs, we actually append to this file. Now let's check out demo.txt and we have both of those lines. So how the world are you still spinning? And if you look at the status of Git, we can see that there's a modified version of demo.txt. So, pretty simple so far. So there's no, um, and now, let's add, the, uh, let's commit this again. So what happens? Here is the what's successful. Um, the thing is that we didn't add the file to commit again, uh, and to git again. So git wants you to, every time, add all the files, all the changes um, by themselves. And this can be a little bit annoying. You could think that oh, all running all git add commands and so on isn't that great. So therefore there is a shortcut here. You could do git, minus, uh, git commit minus a. So that essentially means that you um, add all of the files that are already tracked by GitHub. Uh, by git um, to the repository. So if you get run git commit minus a minus m, then the commit suddenly works. So you can see one file change, one insertion. So now let's take a look at the log. <coughs> um, and here, this is the commit log. This is also what makes this safe, because this is a unique cache of the commit. Um, and this is also what we will use um, when we pull your repository for the homework, we will actually download uh, your repositories and then we will send you this string to tell you which latest commit we are grading. So that's simply for you to make sure that everything worked out fine. So this is essentially uniquely identifying this commit. Okay. So now next step is we create a branch. So I'll create a draft branch. And this last part here, the draft is really completely arbitrary, so I could put any, any word here. Um, now let's look at what git branch tells us. It tells us like git branch lists all the branches, and we have the master and the draft. And the master has a star, <coughs> and that means that this is the active branch. Um, so if you want to switch to the branch, to the draft branch, you can say git check out draft okay now I switch to branch draft and let's check out if there's something different <coughs> and we can see nothing is different of course because we just created a branch and haven't changed anything so let's edit it I'm again adding a file a uh, line
okay. And it's like, what do you want? Now we have three lines in this file. Hello world, I use it spinning, spinning round and round. Let's commit it again. And now I'm running it without the uh, M command. And now it's actually uh, throwing me into a, an editor, and I can add my commit message here. It's so like added third line, and then exit. And on some Unix systems, this will throw you into VI. If you don't know VI, you will have a hard time getting out of VI. Um, but um, this is just a side note. So uh, now I'm, I'm checking out the master branch again. And let's check out what happened in master. I guess you can all guess. Nothing. So we're still here. The third line isn't here. So what happened if you want to? Um, uh, add something to this file here. states and the repositories. Like we have this here. We have this here in the master branch and we have something different uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the second in the draft branch. So now we'll try to merge those two branches. Like I'm running the merge command git merge draft. And the merge command works this way that it always merges the thing that you specify into the currently active branch. So I'm currently on the branch master, and this command tells us to merge it into a draft into master. So what I'm doing here is ex uh, I'm executing this, and actually this worked without a hassle. And this worked because um, we changed the file in two different places. So we changed it at the beginning and at the end. So if we wouldn't have done that, um, here I've deviated a little bit from my script. In the script I have actually created a conflict by changing something at the bottom of the file. <coughs> um, so, but you can look at this, uh, what happened here. Like, in, in this case, like, we created a conflict and we can see like, this would be the result of the demo.txt. Here we would have the conflict. This indeed um, com conflicts with the spinning round and round. So here we would have to go in and manually resolve this conflict by simply editing this, like removing this line here, choosing which of those two lines we want to keep, uh, or if you want to keep both, we can keep both, and then committing again. Okay, so this is the basics of working with Git and branches. Any questions about this so far? You can go through this, of course, later. Yeah? Um, a merge seems like it get pretty complicated if you've got lots of Yes, um, it can. Uh, the, the best uh, approach to avoid that is that you keep always up with the master branch if you're in the feature branch. So that you have as small as possible of changes. So let's say um, you're working somewhere here um, and people keep, keep working on the master branch. Um, then you would all, like every time you start something new, or um, you would simply catch up with the master branch, resolve all the little conflicts right away. Um, and thus avoid the larger conflicts. But of course, this has to be manual. Yes? How do you move between commits if you want to go back? Between commits? Yes. Um, you can actually check out every single commit. Okay. Um, <laughs> so if you have this, this uh, hash number, so you can go to um, git history. Oops. Well, I don't know all of the comments myself. <laughs> so let's check. I can log it. Yeah, so here you see all of the logs of the commits, and then you can say git check out and then this hash number and then you are this commit. Um, in practice, what I typically do uh, is I use GitHub, because GitHub makes it easy to navigate between all of the different, like you can use it to do this in a web interface. 
if you want to change something significantly, it's better to do it on locally on your computer. But if you just want to browse what you did when, um, the, the, it's easy to do that with GitHub. And you can also do that with um, with um, gra graphic um, command line, um, with graphical user interfaces for Git. I don't know, what if you name a branch to the same name as the commit? Like you can't name the commit. The commit has an automatic name, which is the hash. So I mean, like you create you create a commit, and now you have to create a branch with the same commit ID. What would happen? Would it break? Or? <laughs> you can try. I have not. <laughs> I assume that this should work because it's treating the names of the branches differently than the actual hash of the commit. Um, so I expect not to be an, there not to be an issue. Um, uh, the command, the command for checking out the commit might also be a little bit different. I don't know it by heart here, so I would simply Google that. Okay. No worries. Any other questions? You're working on say the cable, and then want to move your work over to your laptop. How do you do that? Uh, well, the easiest way is if you, uh, well, there's two ways. So, A, you can use it dire Git directly as it was intended. So, you can have the IP address um, of your laptop and your desktop, and you could just, like, I will talk about pulling uh, in the next uh, part, but then you could just pull from your laptop, or you can use an intermediate server like GitHub, which is probably the easiest way to do, uh, especially if your, if your data isn't sensitive. So, here you could use a server, but you could even, like, as I said, Every single Git instance is equal. Uh, there's no difference, so you could pull from any computer, and that's how people use Git in the beginning very much. Um, nowadays, we've moved back a little bit to the server, because um, running a server is also not something that most people are comfortable with. You have to have a static IP, you have to uh, care about security, you have to uh, care about access to the server, and so on. So um, that's why people use like internet servers instead of just um, merging between their own any other questions? Okay, so let's start working with GitHub. Um, and so GitHub is actually is good for exactly this example here. If you if I want to merge between or if I want to work in a team, I, I can do that just with Git. But GitHub makes it easier um, for you. So um, and just um, a note, GitHub is one of this like as a commercial software, is a, a commercial platform. It's great for open source projects, but there's others out there. For example, Bitbucket um, provides free repositories. Um, I just we use GitHub in this class because um, it has a lot of nice features. It's well supported. It, a lot of like D3, for example, is hosted on GitHub. It comes with a wiki and so on. So you will be using GitHub uh, if you do JavaScript or web development or D3 development. You will be like encountering GitHub a lot. Um, so we are using GitHub uh, in this class, but you can like. For any of your private projects, you can use Bitbucket or whatever, uh, that's also possible. So we create a new, a new repository by simply going to this website, github.com slash new, and you can see like this here is my profile. I have a couple of other profiles that are organizations, but I could create um, a repository and I can name it however I want. There's no conf, yes? So, can I ask you a question about the merge really quick? Sure. Um, so say you're working with someone else, is it better for you just Kind of be like working on the same version and then you're both committing or is it better to merge after? So when you're working with someone else you're actually working on two different branches um, so you have to merge so that you can't really work on the same uh, branch in the first place because what you need to think about is that um, The only the only way you could actually work with somebody else on the same branch is if they if you use the same computer at different times. Uh, but if you don't use the same computer or if you work at the same time, you will have like you have your local. You have your local like you're developing here in your local Git, and your friend is developing here. So you're completely independent, but maybe you have a shared ancestor. Um, so like you're always working in a separate branch when you're working in a team. Like, you have the local branch that you're changing. And then when you synchronize with this team, you're, like, it, it doesn't look like it, but it's, 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 it's uh, still a, a merge command. So that's what I will be talking about now when we were talking about working with GitHub. So this, um, for example, in my daily life, when I work in code, um, the merges I do, like 95% of the merges I do are not because of branches, but because of working with other people. So somebody else has committed something to the centralized 
Git repository, I'm pulling the changes, I have a conflict, then I have to resolve that. It's not so much about the uh, about creating branches, which is also important, but in practice that happens more often when you work with other people. Is that okay? Thanks. Okay. So here I'm creating a repository which is called Demo. I'll add a, a little bit of a description. Um, I'm deciding to make this private. Um, you guys should also make this, do this for your homeworks, as I already stated on Piazza. It's okay if you don't have it for homework zero, but for homework one, you may not commit anything that you do for homework one unless your repository is private. So you will have to work locally um, unless your repository is private. And then you can choose to initialize your repository. I'm just going to skip this for now. Um, there's also git ignore files. So if you're working with things like um, Java, for example, then you could <coughs> ignore all of the class files automatically so git wouldn't bother you um, to add any class files. Now I could say create repository. And now uh, GitHub tells me, OK, I have created a repository, and this is where it lives. Uh, so this is the URL of the repository. I have two ways of, of working with this repository via SSH or HTTPS. Uh, I'm not going to cover SSH. Um, it's it's uh, easy to do if you if you want to do that. But we'll work with um, HTTPS here. So back here. So now I'm cloning the repository from GitHub. So I'm going back into this console here, and now I run git clone and I paste. Uh, the URL of the repository. So now this tells Git clone whatever is in this repository, the head of this repository, so like this terminal commit, clone that to my local hard drive. When I run that, it tells me cloning into the demo. Um, it tells me warning you might have appeared to clone an empty repository, um, and then we can look, and here is a new folder which is called demo. So I can change directory into this folder, and then I can see there's nothing in here, but I will see that there is this git configuration uh, file here. So now this repository was not initialized locally on my computer, but it was, it was initialized on GitHub. And now let's take a look. We looked at this config file earlier. Um, now let's take a look how this looks for this particular repository. So this is a little bit more complicated here. So we can see the local branch master um, is what we saw before, but now we also have a remote the origin of this repository. Um, and there, here it tells me this is the URL of this repository. So it tells us um, um, here this is the source of this repository. So um, now I'm writing something into this repository.
So now that demo.txt uh, has a change here on the repository, which is on GitHub, not on my local repository. So if I go here, I can't see the repository. And you probably believe me that you won't be able to see the change, but if I run git pull, it actually merges in the change. And that's how you collaborate with somebody else. So you push, somebody else pulls, uh, and that's how you synchronize between these repositories. And of course, you can run into the same troubles as, as with branches. You can have conflicts and so on. Um, and sometimes mergers are seamless. Sometimes mergers can be conflicts. OK. So these are the basics. Um, this is 90% of what you need to do. Can we take a look at the merged file? Sure. Here we are. Uh, can I have something you can uh, test? Uh, now I'm adding something here. This will create a conflict. So now I've made local changes to both. And now if I run, um, first I have to commit. And now if I run uh, git push, it won't work. So it tells me uh, error failed to push some uh, refs to the GitHub repository because um, there is a different state. And I always have to resolve any, any conflicts, any different branches locally before I'm allowed to push somewhere else. So now I can uh, commit worked. Note that com commit worked because the, uh, like right now locally my computer doesn't know that something else has changed. But I can pull. And the pull will tell me Okay, um, there is a conflict, and I have a merge conflict in demo.txt, so I have to <coughs> edit demo.txt, and you can see here is this example that I showed you before. Um, I can remove like this markup that shows me where it merges. Now I have a combination of what I did on GitHub and what I did locally, and I can exit. And now I can push. Git can get first. Now it worked. And now we're here. We also have the combinations. So if you were uh, to pull from the repo and um, you have one file, you just have track. Yep. It will warn you. It will warn you, yes. Uh, that also happens when you um, work with a branch. Um, so it will tell you um, this will uh, override this file that is not tracked. Um, you have to stash it or you have to remove it uh, before you actually can do that. Is the pull basically a merge? Yes. It's, a, it's essentially pull is like an agglomeration of different commands. Um, that doesn't merge from a remote server. And the, you could also be, like this poll is, this works that simple because I have specified one origin uh, in the config file, but you can pull from any different computer. So you can run git pull uh, my other server. Um, but this, this, like, this abbreviation that you have here that you can just run git pull is just to make the most common workflows easier. So if you wanna, like, read, there's a lot of literature on how to do these things. And you'll probably encounter some problem with Git, uh, with Git at, at one point, and you'll just have to look up the documentation or ask on Piazza. Any other questions? Yes? It seems important to note that if you edit on the website, it's like a commit and a push. So people will exactly. have to deal with anything you do in the web, and if you do partial edits in there, then they'll have to deal with that. Yeah. As well. So um, this is true, and I would strongly recommend that you don't do anything to your code uh, on the web, because what you can't really test your code on the web. Uh, so this is really used for if you want to do an update to a readme or something like that, something minor, if you want to change a command on the, uh, a comment or something like that, then you can do that on the web. It's possible, but you shouldn't develop code uh, on, on, on the web. It's a good, good uh,
Okay, so the next part here, um, okay, so a, a word about GitHub issues. Um, GitHub issues are a great way to keep track, especially if you're in a team, but even if you're yourself, to structure your work. So you can create issues, I could say, um, like all of these repositories come with an issue tracker, and I could say create a new issue, and I'm missing, missing, author name, um, and then I could put details here. And this also um, allows you to easily um, draw pictures and so on, describe box and so on, um, and you can also assign people and so on, so it's very convenient to work with. Um, so I'm submitting the issue, and now I have this issue tracker. That's not something you have to use, but I recommend you use it when you work with a team. And the great thing is that you can do things like um, going back to this file, and I'm going to edit it again. And now I can say fixed author fixed one as author. And that will directly close the issue. Now if I look at the issue tracker here. There is no issue there anymore. If I remove this, this open here, um, we can see the issue, and you can see that this was actually closed in this commit. So now we have like a really good provenance of what is going on, and that is important for doing good software development. So I can directly reference what commit actually did some action that people care about. So this is a good workflow. You're not going to use it for homework one or so, um, but it might be interesting to use for your projects. If um, if you are working on your computer to put that same thing for the description. It'll still it will actually um, only do that if you push. So, yeah. yeah. But it, this works the same way, yeah. Um, and you can also reference, uh, you can also say worked on issue number 15, and then it will add, okay, this commit is related to issue number 15, but doesn't resolve it. Um, and then you can also paste these um, hash IDs into a comment. So if you forgot to do that, you could say uh, add a comment to the issue tracker. Um, I worked on this in uh, in uh, commit number, and then you have the long hash, and that will again reference this. So this is a good way to simply keep track of what you're doing. Yes? Uh, will it exactly like a checkout mean like? Uh, pretty much. Uh, uh, when you check out, we can compare to Well, you can, this is, uh, SVN also does, um, this is a feature of GUI clients. It's not a feature of SVN itself. And there's GUI clients for GitHub, uh, for Git that do that too. Um, but not on the, on the command line. Um, but I have like, there is a, the next section here um, is actually, um, like, I'll talk a little bit about uh, GUI clients for Git. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is 4 key. So let's say I'm looking at the D3 repository. Okay, well, I'm actually not going to do it because this looks bad. But you could create a copy of that. So I'm just going to go back to my. What did I do? <coughs> yeah, I'm going to uh, here. Not the home one solutions, but the <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's say I'm floating the website. So I could say create a fork of a specific repository. <coughs> I can't just oh I can't hear. So here you can if you click on this here, you create a fork. That means GitHub copies this repository somebody else created into your local uh, GitHub account. And then you can work on it without interfering with the or owner's code. So this is exactly this, what I showed here, like this branching off, and you can work on it, and then after you've done, uh, you've done your job, you can, uh, you can submit a pull request, and the owner of the original repository can then review your code and merge it into his code base if he likes, or can reject it because he says, this is obsolete, your code is bad, or, or whatever. Um, so this is how you really develop open source software nowadays. Okay, so. In the interest of time, I'm going to keep this short. We only have half an hour left. Um, there's a GitHub desktop option. You can download it uh, at this link. 
Um, I personally don't use it, but um, <coughs> this is how it looks like. Um, you can see like the various uh, repositories that you track. If you like graphical user interfaces to manage your code, you can do this out of integrated development environments. So if you, for example, like I posted a key for WebStorm, uh, if you, for example, add a file, if you're in a, working in a uh, project directory that um, tracks, um, that uses Git, um, <coughs> WebStorm recognizes this. Whenever you create a file, it will ask you to um, add the file to Git automatically, and it will, you can also uh, run commits and pushes and pulls out of WebStorm. So um, these are the features that you can also use if you don't want to use the command line. So uh, down here is a little bit of, a bit of an instruction that you should really follow closely to actually um, get the best workflow for your homeworks. So I'm going to go through this quickly. So what I'm doing here is I'm cloning this, this homework repository where we will always put our latest versions of the homework. So if we add, like when I, tonight when I publish homework one, it will go into this repository. But if we find a bug in any of the homework assignments, we will always also update this in this repository. So um, essentially, you, if you have this repository locally, you, you always um, make, can make sure that you have the latest version of the code. So I'm going to just top level directory here, and um, I'm going to clone uh, the homework repository. Okay. Now I have the 2015 database course homework in here, and you can see it in blue how to read homework zero folder here. And I can go into the homework zero folder and look at the homework zero um, um, at the homework zero content. So in your case, like I'm able, to, I'm allowed to push to this repository, but you're not. You're only allowed to read from this repository. But you still want to. Um, uh, the, the one thing that we did here is that we uh, added this minus o homework at the back. So what that means is that we don't have the default remote origin, but we have another origin. So if we look at this, the config file here. You can see that we have here that could be remote origin as we had it before, but in this case it's remote homework. So this actually tells us that this is not the origin, like this, this um, remote repository that we call origin, this is by convention, the central repository, but this is another origin, another remote um, for this one. Um, and the great thing about this is that you can now hook up your private homework repository to this, uh, and, and then you can pull in changes that we do, and you can push changes that you do to your own repository. So now we create um, a repository on our GitHub website. Um, and I am creating a new repository. And here, last name, first name. Thanks. OK. I already did that, so I'm just going to shorten it here. Private, important. Um, not initialize it with anything, create a repository, and this will create your repository. So here we have the, um, uh, the URL of the repository. And then now what we do is we add another remote. So like I mentioned that we have now this homework remote, and now we add the origin. So by running this command, <coughs> did is added the remote origin here. And now we have two different repositories that this is synced with. And now whenever we make a change to the homework, all you do is uh, git pull homework. And this is how you will get any updates to the homeworks that you have. And it will merge them. So if there is any, if you give you any template code and this discover a bug, um, it will merge this into your code. Um, so this is a very efficient way of, for you to manage, manage your uh, homework. You don't have to do that, um, but we recommend that you do that. And if you then do any local changes, you would just git pull and push from your local repository. You don't have to specify the destination because origin is the default. OK, don't forget to add database TA, our GitHub user. Um, yeah, and here is also how you, like, Please take a look and read this 
this is how you, like the same process, how you add and so on files. Okay, any questions about this process? Great. Um, it seems a little complicated at first, I guess, but um, it is actually a, a nice workflow once you get used to it um, a bit. Good, so, yeah, take a look at this last part. I'm skipping over because we're pretty late and I kind of want to do a little bit of HTML at least. Okay, so going back to the, to the schedule, the second part of this lecture is about HTML, CSS, and SVG. Uh, and in this case, um, I, got, I want to acknowledge Carlos Scheidega, who, who teaches a visualization class um, in Arizona. He was generous enough to um, allow me to use uh, his content, so what you see here is partially based on, on what he wrote for his class. Um, um, I've made um, some modifications, and the one thing that I like is that I, like here, um, in the future, whenever we talk about code, we will have this um, live editing here. So you can actually go to this website now and play around with it, so you can simply remove any HTML elements and you will immediately see what is going on. Okay, so who has worked with HTML before? Everybody, great. So um, some of this, what I'm saying now is, is a little bit redundant, I assume, but I just wanted to say it so everybody uh, is, is on the same page. Okay, so HTML is, uh, was used mainly to do document markup. Nowadays, it can be, it's used to do um, almost anything on the web. So in combination with JavaScript, we kind of have a new operating system um, that applications are more and more deployed towards to. Um, and HTML usually works in a combination with a, with, like, with a server and a client, and if you, take, if you actually read the book, you, there is a little bit of that. Um, we're not going to talk about server-client communication and so on uh, today, but we're just going to talk about um, what is HTML if it is or has arrived on your client. So HTML is a markup language that is rendered in your browser. So like you have these text definitions of how something, what something means and how something should look. Um, and then your browser interprets this and creates a rendering of it. Um, one important part about, or the most important part about uh, HTML are elements. So elements are always stored between tags. In this case, we have this element that here is strong. Uh, we could also say, instead of strong, make this italic. Will also be an element. So uh, the, the important part about elements is that they have um, an opening and a closing tag, in this case italic um, or strong, um, and that they can also be nested. So here we could have like a strong uh, element first, and then we could nest an underlined element down here. So this is strong, and this is both underlined and strong. I could then do something out here that is only underlined, but not strong. But this here, that shouldn't, that isn't legal if I like do it like that. So I start on the line here, it works, and you will find that you can do some atrocious things in HTML and the browser will still <coughs> not complain. But this is not a uh, good style. And you can also see that the color highlighting doesn't work. So you shouldn't, like, when you nest something, then you need to close the lowest level of an element uh, at this lowest level, and you shouldn't. Uh, like you here, I start with strong, then I nest you, then I close strong, and then I close you. So that's really bad. And it will, like in this case, it does what, what you would probably have hoped for, but this will actually um, lead into problems. So in addition to the tag names, you can also have attributes uh, to them. So here we have uh, the link, and I'm sure that everybody has done this before, and href defines where the links goes, the hyperref. Um, and this is a link to Google's main page. I can use single or double quotes here, that doesn't matter um, for the attributes, both are legal. I'm using the single quotes here just because of how I parse this page. Um, but um, typically, uh, double quotes are maybe a little bit more common. So in this case, we have the anchor element. Well, it used to be an anchor, but nowadays it's commonly used as a like, link. Um, and the href, which means HTML reference, um, and that links it uh, to the, the, the targets defined in here. Okay, so 
Um, attributes are really important. We have like a limited list of uh, um, elements uh, and, and tags, and then we have for each of those we have different attributes, and we'll be using attributes a lot. Um, today we'll be using, for example, a lot the ID, the class, the style uh, attribute to um, uh, identify elements in the HTML um, and to uh, make them look nice. There's, um, like typically, elements contain an opening and a closing tag. There's also self-closing tags, like break, for example. Like if you want to break a line, it doesn't really make sense to open a break and close a break. Um, until HTML4, you had to write it either like this or like that. Now you can just write break without a slash. That's legal HTML5 code. Um, HTML5 isn't really, um, is not strictly, is not XML anymore. Uh, you can write an XML like dialect of HTML that is also legal, but the typical HTML5 that you see is not XML, so you can actually um, just write break here, and this is absolutely legal and the uh, uh, validators want it. So um, here is a list of important tags, like paragraph, um, here is image, like image source, and I define here the Utah logo, and this is how it looks. A little bit. Um, then we have um, headers, so header one, header two, and you should use this structure. Um, your any documents you might write, then you have lists, ordered lists in this case, with nested list elements, unordered lists with nested list elements. Then we have the table, um, and in this case the table has a border so that you can actually see it, but typically what you would do is um, that you would not specify a border here, but rather style it with CSS, and we'll talk about CSS in a minute. Um, we have column headers, and like here we have header semantics. Uh, and here these are just simple table rows with uh, table data. Um, and then we can use um, HTML to structure. Like, and there is this div, which is a divider, and it's a block element. Um, but now there's also other elements like um, I'll have one example later, but you can have like a main, you can have navigation and so on. And in HTML5, these are all legal um, tags that you could use to simply make it a little bit more easier to read your code. And they behave the same as if. <coughs> this is a block element, in contrast, in contrast to that, span is an inline element. Most elements in HTML are, are block elements, but some are inline elements, and the difference is here. So you can see here, this isn't a div. Um, but here, this is in a span. Here, like we have a span in between. That's a little easier to see uh, on a screen with more resolution. Uh, but so what happens here is we don't have a line break. And these spans can be um, interesting if you want to define something within the line and you need to identify it. Um, and we'll talk about how to identify it. Um, you can also use forms in HTML. And here is a simple example of how you could do a form. Um, you would then have some additional information about where to submit it if you actually need to do that, uh, but we won't be using that too much in this class. Uh, and then in HTML, you also have a comment tag, which looks like this, um, and you close it like this, and the text here is in the source, but it's not shown here in the result. Okay, any questions about that so far? But I guess it's pretty straightforward for everybody. Okay, um, and you can always look at uh, the output of any of these examples here directly in a new page, so you can actually like, um, get rid of all the clutter off the uh, website. There are some other tags um, which are um, called document metadata, which you kind of need to um, write a legal document, uh, a legal HTML document. So the first one is HTML, which creates the entire HTML container, and we have head, which creates the header where you put all your script information, uh, your, your style sheet information, and so on. Um, then you can link to external uh, documents, and here is a reference to a style sheet, and I'll talk about this later more, um, but this is an important way of, of how you should um, use CSS to style, like to, to include CSS. Um, and then we have the body tag, which essentially marks the content of the HTML that is actually rendered within the browser. And here is a, like, um, a word on resources. Um, there is this um, Mozilla Developer Network, uh, which is a pretty good reference for everything that is related to web development. So whenever you search for something, I recommend that you add MDN to your search string. Otherwise, you will, add, uh, you will end up at the 
um, W3C um, site. So if I, for example, Google for HTML element, it will actually go to this uh, W3 uh, schools, which is not a great resource. They, this is sometimes buggy, sometimes out of date. Um, and it also like, they, they look like they're uh, part of the official uh, uh, www consortium, but they are not. So um, I'd strongly recommend the Mozilla Developer Network over uh, this W3 school as a resource, especially for JavaScript. For HTML, you won't find a lot of uh, wrong things <coughs> in the W3 schools, um, but for JavaScript, the Mozilla Developer Network is much better. Okay, so like here is the here is the absolute minimal HTML document. So we have like just the basics. We have the HTML tag. We define the language. Then we have define the character encoding. We use UTF-8, uh, and you should use always use UTF-8 in your homework projects because the three also uses the UTF-8, um, and it will just make your life easier. Um, then we have a title tag, which is empty in this case. But if I add something here, like test title. Um, that doesn't show up here, uh, but if I, well, in this case it doesn't, because this is static, but this would show up here in the browser tag the title. Um, and then we have the body, and within the body we, we see what is actually rendering here. And so these little boxes always show you the content of the body. Okay, so. Now we've, we've talked a little bit about how we structure HTML, but um, there is something that you should be aware of that is called the document object model, the DOM, uh, and this is the hierarchical representation of the HTML code. But there's a difference, like the HTML code you write, especially when we start working with JavaScript, doesn't necessarily correspond one-on-one -on -one with the DOM. So what we will do is we will dynamically create the DOM, we'll dynamically create HTML um, and that is rendered in the browser. So it's important to, to see this um, and the difference. And what we could do is, and this is like the most important thing that you can learn in this class, is um, in stack elements, like if you just use the uh, Chrome developer tools, um, you can go to any website and you can simply look at their source code. Um, and so there's two different things here. There is, this is the DOM. You can see all of these elements here, and I can hover over any of those elements, and or you can say in stack element, uh, for this uh, for, um, for this particular um, uh, element here, and it will tell me this is what, where it is in the DOM. This is how it is nested in the DOM. So it's in HTML body, div page content, div wrap, div post, article post content. So it's pretty deep in the hierarchy. Um, it will tell me what is the attribute. It will tell me how big it is, and it will show me the margins and so on. Um, so that is great. And here on the right, it will show me all of the styles that apply to it. And I can also change those live. So I could say, uh, modify that. And now, like, I, this is the way I could easily test things out if I want to, like, wanna have, if you want to debug your code and you want to just look what, uh, how can I identify an element, you can just live manipulate the CSS in the Chrome developer tool. Um, there's this kind of developer tools, they exist in all of the browsers. Like if you, if you prefer to work with Safari or Firefox, there are loads of um, versions of these developer tools. Um, just note that we use Chrome as a reference, so if whenever we grade your homeworks, we're looking at whether it works in Chrome. In the real world, of course, you would have to make sure that it works in all platforms, but we don't want to deal with these browser compatibility, compatibility issues. So we're always looking at your code with the latest version of Google Chrome. And so we should at least test your code with Google Chrome. Okay, um, here's a good overview of the developer tools. They're actually much more powerful and we'll use them a lot. Um, so here, okay, one key difference um, that I wanted to mention is this is the DOM, but this is not the HTML source. So <coughs> here is the HTML sources, and they can actually look this up, um, the various files, um, and the HTML Sources are not like can be compiled into something completely different in the DOM. If, for example, if I dynamically use JavaScript to add elements to the DOM, this will be very different. Um, and in this case, even these HTML sources are automatically generated from a different language, but that's a, a different story. So, you will not in, in your career 
uh, you will not be writing a lot of HTML websites uh, that just use plain HTML. Probably in the, in the future, you will always write code that generates HTML if you do a web project. So I still have the nice green links here. Um, okay, so that's the basics about HTML. We have seven minutes left. Great. So um, back in the day, uh, in the beginning of HTML, there were a lot of formatting attributes directly built into HTML. So you could specify things like the width of a table directly in HTML. This is deprecated. This is not allowed anymore, and it's deprecated now. And the reason for that is the idea of a separation of, of content and semantics and style, so that you could apply different styles. Uh, for different needs. So for example, you would want to have a website that works both on the computer screen and on the, web, on the, on the phone. So for the data discourse website, for example, uh, you will notice that there's a different menu depending on whether you, whether you use it on the, on, the, on the phone or whether you use it on the um, desktop computer. You might want to be able to um, um, make your website accessible to blind users, for example, or to make them easy to, to be read to blind users. So if you do that correctly with the proper structuring and so on, you can do a lot to make things easier for these various platforms and devices that uh, HTML is now used on. Um, and CSS allows you simply to separate the presentation from the content and from the meaning. Uh, and that's where CSS comes in. So um, CSS can be specified in a number of ways, in three different ways. Um, we will be using um, in these examples, we will be using this style here. So I have in the header, um, I have this, these two style the tags, and in between here, I define um, CSS code. In practice, that is not the best way to do it um, for larger projects, because in, in practice, you want to have separate CSS files. But for these examples, it's, it's simply very convenient, because I have everything that I need to show you in, in one file. And I'll talk more about how the other things work. Later. So what we do here is like um, the, the key thing that you need to know about CSS are selectors. So um, CSS is applied to all of the elements that you select. And how you specify this, like the elements that you select, um, that's work through a selector. So in this case here, I have um, used an ID selector, strong. So here, um, all of the strong elements are rendered with background color red and at 300%. And that's how pretty this looks here. You can see, and this part is strong. So I could modify this here to green, uh, and I would see that green, and then if I remove the strong tags and replace them with bold tags, for example, this would not apply anymore. But if I change that selector here to bold, it suddenly applies again. <laughs> so this is very cool, but it has some limitations. So if I would say, this is something special, um, and this is my title. Of course, you shouldn't use both for that, but you should use a header one. And then here we have some, some important text. So what happens now, since I'm again using the bold uh, tag, this is also green. Uh, but maybe that's not what we want. We have defined, like, we, we this is a title in the top here. Like, in our head at least, so this has a different semantic. So instead of this um, tag specific or this identifier specific um, uh, selections, we can use uh, a different type. Well, in this case here, okay. so one thing I wanted to say first is that you could do um, those two things, um, like you could have multiple select, um, you can have multiple instances <coughs> that all apply. But here we have two strongs and that has the same result. And I can put at the third um, we have text shadow. Uh, I don't know the parameters for text text shadow art. Um, and So um, as you can see, if you apply this model, if you identify it uh, multiple times, um, you could see uh, that this works too. So yes. So would the, if you specify uh, the color twice, which one would be the, the last, last one? one? 
we can try it. Any other questions? And if you, if you have any conflicts in your CSS, and if you have some multiple or like applications, if you have multiple selections and conflicting elements, there is a very ambiguous set of, or not ambiguous, but not very, uh, let's say, human understandable uh, list of rules that apply when what is given preference. Um, so in this case that I uh, edited up here, where we have two different semantics for the same tag, um, we can't really distinguish them at this point. But what we could do here is we could use instead of this, um, the selectors based on the elements, we could use class selectors. And, and this is a very important thing. I could say here, so we have a class important and we have a class footnote. Um, and then we have two divs. Uh, the one has class importance, the one has class footnote. So notice that both of them are divs. And then we have a class that is both an important one and a footnote. Um, so now we can apply these styles to like based on these specifications of the classes here. And this is how that looks. So we have the um, important is bold, the footnote is 75% of the size, and this is an important footnote, so it means it's both 75% and bold. And um, we can also do use these things multiple times, so I could add a second footnote. Um, so this is really classes. You can apply a class, is, as it says, right, a class of elements. You, and there's, you expect that there will be multiple of them, and the style that we find applies to all of them. And that's a very important way to identify objects. Um, and in contrast to that, where you can't do these multiple things, is the ID selectors. And ID selectors, um, yes? Hi. We're running out of time. We're running out of time. Please. Okay. So I will continue from here. Uh, next time, I'll start with ID selectors. Um, please, um, if you want to do homework one over the weekend, just read through the script, and you will be good to go. Thank you. See you next week.